in in the book of Jude tonight, so I would ask you please to turn there with me. And we come tonight again to the 8th verse, and we'll read down to verse 13. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are blemishes on your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, looking after themselves, waterless clouds, swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. And tonight we're going to set our focus especially on verse 11. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. Let's bow together for prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on our time tonight in His Word. Father, we love You. We thank You that we do. We love our Lord and Savior Jesus, who gave Himself for us. And we love You, Holy Spirit, our paraclete, our helper, who is with us and in us. And Lord, we ask that tonight you would bless this time we have of preaching. Bless, Lord, the preaching of your word. Bless the reception of it. Deal with our minds and our hearts in a way that is supernatural, in a way that can only be explained by you. Lord, we need this, and we desire this, and we ask for this. And we rest assured of this, for Lord, we know that you meet with your church, and we know that your presence with us tonight is, is not for, for nothing. And so we're confident in your, in, in your working among us. We continue, Lord, to pray for those in our midst who gather with us who don't know you, and we ask that in mercy... They would see the Lord Jesus for who He really is. For Lord, we know if they ever see Him for who He really is, they will run to Him. We ask You to save. And we ask all this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Wednesday night, we began by asking the question, Is the issue of apostates in the church really a serious issue? I mean, is it really that serious? Does it really deserve the kind of urgency and the kind of fervency that you see expressed in this little letter from Jude and that you see, for example, in the book of Second Peter and that you see in other New Testament passages that deal with false teachers and false disciples? And as you know, and as we've been seeing together, there are many places in the New Testament where we are warned of this reality, the reality of false teachers in our midst and the reality of pseudo-believers, false disciples in our midst. Is it really that serious? Well, we know because this is God's Word that it really is that serious. So when I ask that question, I'm not asking, is it really that serious? I'm asking, do you see that it's really that serious? Do we feel like it is really that serious? And if you would have to admit that you don't really think about it much and you don't really think about it with much urgency, 
or with much fervency, then I would encourage you, even as we look at these verses tonight, to ask the Lord to bring your feelings into agreement with His Word, to bring you to the place where you feel in accordance with what He says. Now, in these verses, we are told why it is that serious. And to sum it up in a nutshell, what we're told is the reason why apostates in the church represent a serious danger to the church is because their presence in the church is an unholy influence. Let us never forget the church is holy. The church is holy unto God. The church has been set apart unto the Lord Jesus Christ. We're a blood-bought people, and the congregation of the saints represents a holy gathering. We are described as the Lord's temple. 1 Corinthians 3.17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you, and that's plural, you are that temple. Collectively, we are, the temp- we are individually a temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in us. We are collectively, as the Lord's church, his temple. He dwells in our midst and he says it's this serious to him. You see, even if we come to a time when men don't take the church seriously, God continues to take his church seriously. And he says, the church is holy unto him so that if anyone destroys the church, God destroys him. Apostates do not represent the building up work of the Holy Spirit. Apostates represent the destroying work of the destroyer. And so they are destroyed. The apostates are destroyed. And that's what these verses deal with. The sure judgment that comes upon people who walk away from Jesus Christ. The sure judgment that falls upon people who have been exposed to truth, who have seen the truth, who perhaps even have professed an allegiance to the truth, and then they walk away from it. When you walk away from Christ, when you walk away from the truth, the only thing that awaits you is judgment. And that's what he's talking about here. We can also say this, those who are false teachers, those who have an unholy influence on the church, they can expect the most severe judgment. And that's what these verses remind us of. That's why it's so serious an issue. Now, how do they represent, how do these apostates represent and how do they exert an unholy influence? Well, we've seen two ways so far in verses eight and nine. We saw that these apostates are characterized by an unholy boldness. They exert an unholy influence in the church in a very bold manner, but it's an unholy boldness. It's like something and it's unlike something. Verse 8, their boldness is like those who have been judged in the past, like the Israelites who were delivered out of Egypt and then wanted to go back, like the angels that left their proper dwelling and left their position of authority and committed some sort of heinous sin in the Old Testament times so that they've been locked away until the judgment of the great day, kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness, verse 6 says, like those angels, like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities that surrounded them, verse 7, like these in the past, verse 8, in like manner these people also. The same kind of unholy boldness that characterized unbelieving Israel, characterized those sinning angels, and characterized Sodom and Gomorrah, that same kind of unholy boldness characterizes these people. They also, he says in verse 8, engage in, verse 8, defiling the flesh, rejecting authority, and blaspheming the glorious ones. This is their boldness. They have the boldness to defile the flesh, knowing that God has pronounced judgment on such sins. They have the boldness to reject authority, knowing that God has clearly judged those who rejected authority in the past. They have the boldness to blaspheme angels. Unlike holy creatures, this is the unlike part, verse 9, but when the archangel Michael Contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses. He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Not even the archangel Michael showed the kind of boldness toward the devil that these false teachers and these pseudo-believers claim to have, apparently over, evil spirits. 
So it's a boldness like those who've been judged in the past. It's a boldness unlike even the, the highest holy creature, Michael, unlike him. He didn't presume to do such things as these people presume to be able to do. Which gets to the second thing that is characteristic of their unholy influence, not only an unholy boldness, but also an unholy ignorance. Verse 10, but these people blaspheme all that they do not understand and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. They speak confidently about things they know nothing of. They blaspheme what they do not understand Yet what they do understand, their animalistic instincts, what they do understand will actually lead them to their destruction. If they follow their senses, if they follow their scheming instincts, they will be destroyed for it. That's where it's all heading. And one of the ways, or the way that's mentioned here, that they justified all of this, verse 8, yet in like manner these people also relying on their dreams... We talked about how we could take that statement. One, it could just be a description of delusion. They live their lives in this false sense of reality. They believe they're right when they're dead wrong. They live their life in a dream, as it were. That's one way you could take this statement. The other way is they're relying on extra biblical information. They claim to be getting this information through dreams that has led them to what they believe, what they're teaching, and how they live. Whatever the case, a dangerous, unholy influence in the church a kind of boldness that is unholy, and they operate in an ignorance that is unholy. Now tonight we focus on the third thing that characterizes them, and you see it in verse 11. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. The third thing that characterizes the apostates is an unholy ambition, unholy ambition. Let's say it this way. What are these men after? Why are they in the church? And by the way, it doesn't have to just be men. If you read the seven letters to the churches in Revelation, you're going to find that one church was condemned because they allowed a woman to exert influence she shouldn't have been able to exert. So it could also be a woman. False teachers, male or female, it doesn't matter. Why are they in the church? I mean, if they're not saved, by the way, apostates are not saved. Apostates are not people who lose their salvation. They're people who never had salvation. They claim to be one of us. They were in the midst of us, but they went out that it might be made manifest. They were never of us, 1 John 2. So they're not saved. Therefore, you know this. You know they're not motivated by what motivates truly saved people. They're not true shepherds, so you know they're not motivated by what motivates true shepherds. So if they're not in the church for the right reasons, why are they in the church? What keeps them here? Now, we know from Satan's point of view why we're going to have to deal with apostates in our midst from time to time, because he sows tares in the world. The field is the world, not the church. The field is the world. But in the world, there are going to be tares, and they're going to be present in the church as well. Because right now the church is in the world. So we know from Satan's vantage point why there are tares sown into the church to disrupt the life of the church and to cause problems in the church. This is why he does it. But from their vantage point, from the apostate's vantage point, what motivates these people to make their way into our midst and to seek to operate in our midst? What motivates them? Well, that's what Jude describes in verse 11. And the Holy Spirit gives us three comparisons. He says they're like Cain, they're like Balaam, and they're like Korah. It's not that every single one of them, you're going to see all of these three things in them. Some may be like Cain, some might be like Korah, some might be like Balaam. But these are three ways that we can understand their motivation, what motivates them, what puts them in the church. He says, first of all, verse 11, they've walked in the way of Cain. Now, he assumes, of course, that we know who Cain is, and we do know who Cain is. You can read about him in Genesis chapter 4, the first murderer, first one to shed human blood in murder. He murdered his brother Abel. And ask yourself tonight, what motivated Cain 
to do what he did? What motivated him to act as he acted? We don't have to guess about that because the Bible tells us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Why did Cain murder his brother? Well, you remember in Genesis 4, they each brought an offering to God. Abel's was acceptable to God, offered in faith. By the way, faith has to have an object. God is the object of faith, but faith is acting on information received from God. Faith is not just doing what you think is best. Faith is obeying God, obeying God's word. And so I believe, though the scripture doesn't tell us this, I believe that these two men had some Revelation, perhaps received from their parents, but some revelation from God about what God wanted, about what God ex expected in the way of an offering. Abel's, a blood offering, was acceptable. Cain's, the work of his own hands, was unacceptable. And he was angry over it. God dealt with him actually in a very patient, encouraging way. Look over to Genesis chapter 4, if you would, quickly. Genesis 4 Verse 1, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? Notice the encouraging words. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain has been confronted by God about what's right and what's unacceptable. He has knowledge of what God will accept. If you do well, will you not be accepted? He knows what is right, but then he willfully walks in the way that is wrong, and he murders his brother. Cain represents self-styled religion. He wanted a religion that he could control. He represents resentment toward God-accepted religion. His brother offered something acceptable and he was angry about the difference. And then he represents hatred toward those who worship God rightly. He hated his brother. He was malicious in his attitude toward his brother. That's what 1 John emphasizes, the hatred of Cain. So what can we say about these apostates? Well, they're going to be characterized by self-styled religion. They're a religion of their own making. They're going to have despite in their heart toward that which God prescribes, which God calls for. And they're going to be characterized by malice toward those who worship God rightly. And especially, as we're going to learn in a moment, I think, toward those in authority over them who worship God rightly. There's maliciousness in their hearts. And you mark this down tonight, beloved. Anyone who carries malice in their heart toward brothers and sisters in Christ, they are malicious and carry malice and hatred in their heart. They are in danger of hell. I mean, they are giving indications that they don't know Christ at all. The evidence that we belong to the family of God, one of the evidences, one of the chief evidences, is that we love one another. And so when we don't love, when there is not love in our heart toward brothers and sisters, there's every indication that we're not brothers and sisters, that we don't know the Lord 
at all. And so these false teachers have gone in the way of Cain. That is, they have known what is right, but they've gone in the way of wrong. It is self-styled. They despise that which is right, and they have malice toward those who represent what is right. Notice the second example he gives. Verse 11, he says, And they've abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. Now, do you see there where it says they've abandoned themselves? That's a very strong word used. It means to pour out or to gush out. And so the idea is they have poured themselves out. They have emptied themselves in their greed. They have emptied themselves pursuing the same kind of error that Balaam pursued. In fact, it's interesting to note the different ways it's translated. The ESV has abandoned themselves. The King James Version has ran greedily after. New American Standard says they have rushed headlong. NIV says they have rushed for. A.T. Robertson says ran riotously. And he goes on to say a vigorous metaphor for excessive indulgence. I mean, they have excessively indulged in sin because they're like Balaam. They've excessively indulged in sin. They have ran after sin because they're like Balaam. Now, again, he expects that we know something about Balaam. What do we know about Balaam? Well, Balaam was a seer. He was a man who prophesied in the Old Testament. You can read about Balaam beginning in Numbers chapter 22, Numbers 22 through 24. He was a prophet. And there came a time when the king of Moab, a man by the name of Balak, wanted Balaam to prophesy destruction on Israel. Balak sent messengers to Balaam. The Bible says they brought with them money for divination. They were willing to pay Balaam to prophesy evil concerning Israel. Now, Balaam knew enough to know he, could, that wouldn't, he couldn't do that. Just him saying something wouldn't make it come to pass. The only thing that he could say was what God said. He couldn't go beyond the word of God. And so he told them that. He told them, I cannot say anything beyond what God says. Nonetheless, he went with them. He went with these messengers back to meet with Balak. You have to ask, why, if he knew God's relationship to Israel, and he did, and if he knew he couldn't prophesy evil against Israel, and he did, why would he even go with these messengers back to meet with Balak? The answer is because he was greedy, because he wanted the money. He goes and he meets with Balak, And in fact, he meets with him at three different locations and three different times he attempts to prophesy destruction on Israel. By the way, this is after, you remember, after he was stopped on his way by the angel of the Lord and he was rebuked by his donkey. That's an amazing account. You can read it on your own time. But he's rebuked. In fact, 2 Peter refers to this. By a donkey, he was restrained from his madness. So he arrives there, meets with Balak. They meet at three different locations. Three times he tries to prophesy evil against Israel. Three times he ends up blessing Israel. Three times he blesses Israel. Because that's God's word concerning them. Now here's what's interesting. After all of that, you come to Numbers chapter 25. Why don't you look over there with me? I want you to see this. Go to the book of Numbers chapter 25. And look at what we read here. Numbers 25 and look at verse 1. Now, this is after he's prophesied blessing on Israel, all right? Verse 25 of chapter 24, Then Balaam rose, went back to his place, and Balak also went his way. Chapter 25, verse 1, While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Wow, what a shift in in information. You you have blessing in chapter 24. Chapter 25, you find out that the nation of Israel is engaging in sexual immorality and idolatry with the women of Moab. What's the connection between this conversation between Balaam and Balak and now the sexual immorality and the idolatry of Israel? Look at Numbers chapter 31. You can read 25 on your own because there's a lot more there, but look at Numbers 31 and look at verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Avenge the people of Israel on the Midianites. Afterward you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm men from among you for the war. They may go against Midian. 
to execute the Lord's vengeance on Midian. You shall send a thousand from each of the tribes of Israel to the war. So there were provided out of the thousands of Israel, a thousand from each tribe, 12,000 armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand from each tribe, together with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, with the vessels of the sanctuary and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. They warred against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every male. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain, Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. And they also killed, notice, and they also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. What happened to Balaam? He was killed. He was killed in battle. Who was he fighting against? He was fighting against Israel. Doesn't stop there. Look on. Verse 9, And the people of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their little ones, and they took as plunder all their cattle, their flocks, and all their goods, all their cities in the places where they lived, and all their encampments they burned with fire, and took all the spoil and all the plunder, both of man and of beast. Then they brought the captives and the plunder and the spoil to Moses and to Eleazar the priest, to the congregation of the people of Israel at the camp on the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the chiefs of the congregation went to meet them outside the camp. And Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds who had come from service in the war. Moses said to them, have you let all the women live? Now notice, behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and so the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. How was it that the women of Moab had the idea to compromise Israel? And it was a strategy of sexual immorality, and it was a strategy of idolatry. By the way, Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 says this, speaking to the church at Pergamum, But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. Did you hear that? Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. I can't curse Israel, but here's what I can do. I can tell you how to make them fall. It's with your women and it's with your idols. Now look back at our text there in the book of Jude. He says these apostates not only are like Cain, they're also like Balaam. In what way? How do they pour themselves out in pursuit of Balaam's error? That is, for gain, for money, for greed's sake... Not only are they willing to teach things they ought not to teach, that's doctrine, but they are also characterized by sexual immorality and by idolatry. They ruin the Lord's church through compromise. This is a warning to us, beloved, that the church must be watchful on two fronts. We not only have to be watchful on a doctrinal front, we have to be watchful on a moral front. And let me just speak to our church here for just a moment about something that I think is very important. We really stress sound doctrine here, don't we? We stress that and we think about that a lot. We talk about that in Sunday school. No doubt we talk about that with one another. But let me also say this to parents, moms, dads, when it comes to your sons and your daughters, when it comes to husbands and wives and families, beloved, if the devil can't get in the door doctrinally, he will still try to get in the door morally. And we had better be watchful when it comes to our families, not only about what we say we believe, but what we live, what we practice. And specifically when it comes to our sons and daughters and this thing called courting or dating, we need to teach our sons and daughters what God's standards are for relationships. Because if the devil can't try to get a foothold in their life in terms of what you're teaching them doctrinally, he will try to get a foothold in their life in the moral realm. He doesn't just stop his attack when it comes to teaching. He also attacks when it comes to morality. And in this way, these apostates endanger the church, not only through their teaching, but through their moral example. 
Now that leads us to the third example he gives, verse 11. Woe to them, for they've walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. And then he says this, and perished in Korah's rebellion. Once again, a very well-known account from the Old Testament, Korah. Look over to Numbers chapter 16, if you would. And I keep jumping back here because even though Jude's readers were very familiar, maybe we're not as familiar. Numbers chapter 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, son of Koath, son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. Not only do you have Korah and Dathan and Abiram, but they are joined by 250 leaders from the people of Israel. In fact, verse 2 The Holy Spirit tells us, well-known men. Verse 3, they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. For all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now, what is their accusation? First of all, what is their contention? Their contention is everybody's holy to God in this congregation. Everybody in Israel is holy to God. So why have you, Moses and Aaron, exalted yourselves in taking the leadership role that you have in our midst? They're accusing him of exalting himself in their midst. Look at the next verse. Verse 4, when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses he will bring near to him. Do this, take censers, Korah and all his company, put fire in them and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. Now, what is Moses? What's his point? You say we've exalted ourselves. We say the Lord has made a choice. And we say that you have crossed your bounds. You've gone too far. Verse 8, And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? He he was a priest. And he's saying, is this not enough for you that the Lord has given you this privilege? Is there something more that you want? Look at verse 11. Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. You've gathered against the Lord. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. And they said, we will not come up. He says, come, meet. We will not come up in verse 12. Is it a small thing that you've brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you must also make yourself a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? Isn't that just an amazingly ludicrous claim? Will you put out the eyes of these men? I mean, where did that come from? We will not come up. Verse 15, and Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them and I have not harmed one of them. And Moses said to Korah, be present, you and all your company before the Lord, you and they and Aaron tomorrow. And let every one of you take his censer and put incense on it. And every one of you bring before the Lord his censer, 250 censers, you also Aaron each his censer. 
So every man took his censer and put fire in them and laid incense on them and stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh... Shall one man sin, and will you be angry with all the congregation? And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to the congregation, Get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart, please, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with all their sins." So they got away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents together with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. If these men die as all men die, or if they are visited by the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new, And the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them. And they go down alive into Sheol. Then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. And as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry for they said, lest the earth swallow us up and fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. That is all who had joined their company. Verse 36, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to take up the censers out of the blaze. Then scatter the fire far and wide, for they've become holy. As for the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar, for they offered them before the Lord and they became holy. Thus they shall be a sign to the people of Israel. God says, I don't want them ever to forget this. Look back, if you would please, at the book of Jude. That's the background for this statement. When he says there in Jude, Woe to them, for they've walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. What does Korah stand for? Rebellion against God-ordained authority. Rebellious disregard for authority. Rebellious ambition for a place, for a role that doesn't belong to him. And that's what apostates do. They disregard. In fact, the word the word for rebel there, or rebellion in verse 11 of Jude, antilogia is the word. Used four times in the New Testament, it means to dispute or to contradict. These are men who dispute with, contradict those who are ordained by God to be in authority, and they themselves have ambition for places of influence and authority that do not belong to them. Is it really that serious? I mean, to compare them to Cain, someone so filled with malice that he murdered, to compare them to Balaam, who took money or desired money, desired gain, attempted to prophesy against Israel, couldn't, so he gives counsel to Balak to take their women and to engage Israel in sexual immorality and idolatry. To compare them to Korah, who though he already had a position of influence in the nation of Israel, wanted a different position of influence and resented the authority of Moses and Aaron and accused them of exalting themselves above the congregation so that the ground opened up and swallowed he and his family and his 250 supporters alive. Is it that serious? It is that serious. Why? Because the church is holy. The church is holy to the Lord. And whoever would destroy the Lord's church, the Lord will destroy them. They're dangerous because they're bold in an unholy way, operating in an ignorance 
that is unholy and they have ambition. You see, that's why they're in the church. Why are they in the church if they're not motivated by what motivates saved people? Because they have an ambition that's unholy. Malicious ambition, greedy ambition, rebellious ambition. And Jude says, verse 11, woe to them. That's a warning. That's a pronouncement of condemnation. I want to ask you tonight, my friend, do you see the seriousness of it? I think if there's a lesson for those of us here tonight who love the Lord, it is that we better understand the holiness of the church to the Lord God. Do we? In this day and age, do we understand the holiness of the church? The seriousness with which God treats His church? Do we understand the dangers facing us, not just doctrinal, but moral? Do we stand against such an influence? And then perhaps there's even somebody sitting here tonight that that's you. Why are you here tonight? What motivates you to sit in your place? Can you honestly say you're here because you love Christ? Now, if that's not your ambition, that's not your reason to be here, what is it? What is it? It has to be something that's not holy. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home, it's in the body, or absent, that's with the Lord, we have one ambition, to be pleasing to Him. My prayer for myself and for everyone here tonight is that we could say we have one ambition, just one, to please the one who saved us, to be well-pleasing to Him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this book is a serious one. It's an urgent one. It's a fervent message and one that's strange to perhaps to the ears of our generation. And yet I pray, Lord, that despite distractions tonight and things that we have persevered through, I pray that the message would be clear and received, that we would understand that your church is holy to you, belongs to you, and Lord, you you take most seriously what, what happens in your church. Lord, I also pray for anyone in this place who's not saved, that they would hear tonight's message as a gracious warning to them, that they would understand that their pretense is endangering their soul, and that they would put away the game, they would put away the mask, and they would come face to face in a real way with your Son. And surrender to Him as Lord and Master and God and Savior. That they would come to Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and for a right relationship with You. May Your Spirit take this, Lord, and continue to deal with our hearts as we leave here. May we not only think in terms of this local church, but in terms of Your church around the world. And Lord, I pray that we'd be more faithful than we've been to pray not only for this church, but to pray for your work around the world and for the purity of your church and for the health of it. We ask you this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.